Over the course of my studies in theoretical physics, I've traveled across the continent and around the world sampling new ideas and tasting different answers to the questions of how and of why. And still, I find there remains a deep hunger which lives within me, a burning desire to share these great ideas with the people around me. And so, I have assembled a team of some of the greatest, most lucid, most creative minds I've encountered in my travels. And I call them my Titanium Physicists. You're listening to the Titanium Physicist Podcast, and I'm Ben Tippett. And now, Allez! Physique! Sometimes things fall apart. They decay into other things. In the regular world, we might say that they decay into their component parts. For instance, when my pen falls apart, it stops being a pen and starts being a collection of pen components. The cap, the body of the spring, the tube of ink, the clicking mechanism, and the tip. Or, if my car were to fall apart, it would become a collection of tires and engine parts and transmission parts and some doors and a frame and stuff. Okay, let's talk particle physics. Specifically, elementary particles like electrons and photons and quarks and stuff, they're not made of anything else. When we say elementary particle, we mean that there aren't two or three things composing them. They've got a unique character and they're indivisible. But elementary particles can be unstable. They can undergo a process we call decay. That is to say, if you take a tau lepton, uh, tau leptons look just like electrons, but they're really heavy. If you take a tau lepton and you put it on the table and you wait long enough, it will turn into a collection of other things, just like your janky old car. But here's the thing. Unlike your janky old car, the tau lepton particle isn't really built out of other particles. It is, after all, elementary and indivisible. And unlike your janky old car, which can only turn into a pile of four tires, a steering wheel, a carburetor, and a donkey when it falls apart, the tau lepton will decay into different piles of other elementary particles. Sometimes it'll turn into a pile composed of an electron and some neutrinos, sometimes a muon and some neutrinos, sometimes a kaon and some neutrinos. So while elementary particles aren't composed of other particles, they can turn into a collection of other elementary particles. And this might seem like a contradiction, but it's actually the fundamental truth to all matter in the universe. So today we're going to talk about particle decays. So in life, some things don't decay, like friendship. To help us talk about particle decays, I've invited my old friend, Dan Jankowski. So Dan and I met at university, and he's led a fantastic life since we graduated. He's worked as a social worker, and has traveled all around the world as an English teacher and a gentleman. And he currently goes to the beach professionally, and he's also the tallest man I know. Hi, Dan! Hey, Ben. How's it going? Thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. For you today, I've assembled two fantastic titanium physicists. Arise, Dr. Ken Clark! Whoosh! Wow, it's a bird, it's a plane, no wait, it's Dr. Ken. So Dr. Ken did his undergraduate at the University of Toronto, and then his master's and PhD at Queen's University, and he's now at Penn State working on Ice Cube. Now arise, Tia Maselli. Boinga, boinga, boinga. All right, Tia is a graduate student at the University of California, Davis, where she studies high-energy experimental particle physics, and she's writing her thesis on Z decays. She's currently a contestant in the two-minute thesis contest at PhD Comics. So, if you like what you hear, go vote for her. So, let's start talking about particle decays. So, let's talk about how these things fit into the natural world. So, I want you to imagine, like, an atom. Imagine what's floating in your head. On the outside, there's electrons. At the inside, there's a nucleus, right? Okay, sure. An electron, as a particle, is part of a family of other particles. So there are other 
elementary particles that are similar to it. They're all called leptons. So there's the electron. There was one called a muon, which is slightly heavier. And then a tauon, which is even heavier than that. So there's three brother leptons. And uh, they all have negative charge, the same charge as an electron does. But they have different masses. Okay? Okay. And the thing about this is, in regular life, you never see tauons or muons. You only see electrons. And that's because tauons and muons decay. They fall apart. Well, they don't fall apart. They turn into other things, you know, fairly quickly. And so all you end up seeing in the end is electrons, because electrons are stable. They don't randomly decay into other things. Now, inside the nucleus of the atom... Nucleuses are made of protons and neutrons, right? But protons and neutrons aren't elementary particles. They're made out of smaller particles called quarks. So the deal is that there's three quarks inside of each proton and each neutron. And each quark is elementary. And just like in the electron where there's an electron and a muon and a tauon, there's different types of quarks. Okay? So there are up and down quarks. Those are the usual ones we see, but there's also weirder ones. There's one called a charm quark, there's one called a strange quark, there's one (laughs) called a truth quark, and there's one called a beauty quark. Sometimes they're called top and bottom quark, the last two. They're just represented by T and V when people do math. Don't worry about it. The moral of the story is, in regular life, the only quarks we ever interact with are up and down quarks, because all of the other types of quarks are also unstable, so they decay eventually into up and down quarks. So in regular life, we only see electrons, we only see up and down quarks, but, you know, if you take high energy physics, if you take particles and smash them together at high enough energy, this uh, gives the system enough energy to generate these unstable particles. Okay, and do they eventually collapse down into just basic up and down? Yeah, eventually they just all go to the stable particles that we see like up, down, electron, and okay. neutrinos, and then also photons. The moral of the story, though, is that there are lots of different particles that are possible, but some of the particles decay into other particles, and others don't really naturally decay into anything. In your intro, you said, you know, you have these, let's just take, for example, electrons. You have these electrons, and you said that there also exist muons and taus, which are, are heavier particles. And they, both the muons and the taus, eventually will decay, and they will decay to the electron. And the reason for that is that the electron has the lowest rest mass of the particles, essentially. So when you're decaying, you can't create mass, you can't go heavier, and in fact, you can't even stay the same. You can't break even unless you produce something at rest. Okay, you can break even, but it's rare that you break even. Essentially, you lose energy. So because you can only do it that way, that's why everything decays to the lightest particle. In each decay, you have to go lighter. You cannot go heavier, essentially. So, I mean, when you say that you lose energy, I mean, it's not completely lost, right? Yeah, you're right. You lose, you lose, I'm doing air quotes. You lose on rest mass. Your rest mass has to be less. Yeah, the rest of that energy goes into kinetic energy, making that end particle move fast. And sorry to interrupt, I just, what's a rest mass? Uh, You can think of it as the mass of the particle. So the electron is the lightest, the muon is heavier, and the tau is heavier still. And we call it rest mass because in all of this physics stuff, energy and mass become interchangeable. And the actual energy of the particle is composed of its rest mass plus whatever other energy it has. And usually we talk about kinetic energy as being the other component. So you know like Einstein's E equals MC squared relation. So kinetic energy is a type of energy, right? If you take an electron sitting still, it'll have a specific mass. All electrons will have the same mass. But then if you accelerate it, if you whip it up so that it's going really fast, sometimes that kinetic energy that you give it is so high that it changes the effective mass of the moving electron. So the kinetic energy counts as a contribution to the overall mass. So the faster you make the electron go, the heavier it seems to get. Interesting. Okay. So that's, that's why we say rest mass, because we're like, you know, an electron is going to seem like it's heavier if it's moving faster. So you have to talk about, you know, if, if you're sitting, if it's sitting still, all electrons will have this one specific mass. Right. If you, if you could put an electron on a scale and it just sat there on the scale, that would give you its rest mass. Okay, sure. That makes sense, actually. Uh, What we were saying was that all particles decay to particles with a lower rest mass, essentially. And as T was saying, the the energy difference between them can go to a number of things, but one of the things is kinetic energy. For example, a muon 
if you take the rest mass of the muon and the difference between the rest mass of the electron, if those were the only two things that just changed immediately, all of that energy could go into the, into the electron moving very quickly. You want a metaphor for that? I got one. Um, I want a metaphor. <laughs> All right, so it's like the conservation of value. Imagine you've got a crisp $20 bill in your pocket. Buy $10 worth of gas, you get back a new particle, the $10 bill, and you can use that gas to, you know, accelerate your car. So you started out with $20 worth of value. You change that into a $10 bill and then $10 worth of velocity in your car. So the conservation of energy makes it so that these particles are always decaying into lighter particles. But these processes are reversible. So if you take one of these electrons, say, and you set up the appropriate conditions, you can give it enough energy so it turns into a muon. So it's only kind of the inescapable flow of time that means that overall you end up with fewer muons as time goes on. Because the system starts out with the muon having a certain amount of energy, it can turn into an electron that has a whole bunch of kinetic energy, and then as that electron bounces around and hits other things, it loses some of that kinetic energy, and then it doesn't have enough energy to turn back into the muon. So kind of like if I was playing guitar and I hit a guitar string, those sound waves will bounce off walls and then eventually dissipate? In essence, that's what's kind of going on. The energy is kind of dissipating into the system so that the electron won't be able to turn back into the muon. Okay. And so instead of having a, an even balance of muons and electrons, all of the muons turn into electrons. That energy kind of dissipates into the system, and then the electrons themselves will no longer have enough energy to turn back into the muons. Okay, but what about all this energy that's disappearing into the system? What happens to all of that? Does it collectively turn into something else, or does it just go away? So, you know, in the universe, there's a lot of empty space. If some of this energy turns into a photon, a particle of light, that particle of light can go off into space and we'll never see it again. So in essence, the universe as it currently is, because it's expanding, it's not really a closed system. So in a star or on Earth, we can lose energy to space and not be able to really get it back. I lose energy to space all the time. That makes sense. Thank you. Is it maybe the next step that... Uh, my analogy was far too simple. It was just one particle going to one particle, and that's not really what occurs most of the time. Yeah, why don't we start talking about that, conservation laws. When we have the muon decay, there's a couple things going on. There's things that need to be conserved when it decays. So, first of all, a muon has an electrical charge. It's negatively charged. So when it decays, it decays into an electron, plus some neutrinos, which are neutrally charged. So the charge needs to be conserved. If it's minus one in the beginning, it's minus one at the end. So the electron and the muon have the same charge. And then muon decay also needs to conserve lepton number. So a muon has a lepton muon number of one. So at the end of the day, the decay particles also need to sum up to a lepton muon number of one. So let's look at the decay particles, which is an electron, an uh, anti-neutrino of electron type, and a muon neutrino. So before and after, we have this muon lepton number. The muon has a one lepton muon charge, and the end product neutrino muon has a one muon lepton charge. And then the electron and anti-electron neutrino, their charge adds up to zero because the electron carries plus electron lepton number charge and the anti-neutrino has minus electron lepton charge. So that sums to zero. So, so the beginning product and the end product have the same lepton flavor numbers. Okay, so, so I understand the conservation of mass, so everything that comes has to, at the end, equal the same thing in the day. But the, the flavor of the lepton, I, I'm a little bit shaky on what an actual lepton is. Is it just is it a term in terms of measuring how these electrons turn into each other, or is it something else special? So it's just a name. So a lepton is just a particle um, that's either an electron, muon, or tau. Okay. And they also have neutrinos associated with them that we kind of skipped over before. Okay, so there is a group of particles called leptons, and they have three what can be called flavors, electron, muon, and tau. 
So an electron has an associated neutrino. So there's electron type neutrino. And there's the same for the muon and the tau. So there's muon neutrinos and tau neutrinos. So when you want to talk about flavor conservation, essentially electrons and electron neutrinos get a, a one in their, let's just call it electron number. So electrons and electron neutrinos get a one. And then their okay. inverse particles, we call them anti-electrons and anti-electron neutrinos get a minus one. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So if you were trying to balance your equation, if you started with, for example, a zero, you could end with a zero by creating both an electron and an anti-electron or an electron and an anti-electron neutrino. Those would both give you a zero at the other end. Okay, sure. This is what we were referring to earlier, is that when you want to go through a decay, if you start, for example, with a muon, which is where we were starting, you have to end up with a one in the muon column. So you have to end up with either a muon or a muon neutrino at the end, because you need that one. But in, a, in addition to that one, you can create other things, such as an electron and an anti-electron neutrino, because those will sum to zero in their electron number, and you're left with a one in your muon number. That totally uh, that's, makes sense. That's, that's roughly how it goes. Let's say that you have ice cream. There's three favors of ice cream. Vanilla, that's like the electron ice cream. Uh, chocolate, that's like the tau on ice cream. And then strawberry, which is kind of a middle flavor. And it's the uh, muon ice cream. So you can change the strawberry ice cream into vanilla ice cream. But in order to do so, you need to extract the flavoring. So let's imagine that there are little bottles of artificial flavoring. Okay. <laughs> So the little bottles of artificial flavoring, if they're full up of artificial flavor, that's called a neutrino. It's got a specific flavor. And the idea here is as we extract and add flavor to our ice cream to change the type of ice cream it is, we need to conserve flavor. You need to extract flavor and put it in a bottle or empty out a bottle. So you take this strawberry ice cream, you extract the strawberry flavoring, then you end up with a little bottle of strawberry flavoring, and then you add vanilla flavoring. But in order to add vanilla flavoring, you end up with a little empty bottle of vanilla flavoring. You start off with strawberry. In the end, you end up with vanilla, but you also end up with one full bottle of strawberry flavoring. That's your muon neutrino. And you end up with a little empty bottle of vanilla flavoring. And that's your anti-electron neutrino. That, that's actually pretty cool. So neutrinos yeah. are delicious. Can I have a coconut flavor? <laughs> I think that's beyond the standard model of ice that's cream. That's a sterile neutrino. They taste like <laughs> coconut. Oh, tasty. So the deal here is that before I used a metaphor for changing money, right? You started out with a crisp $20 bill and you ended up with a $10 bill and some gas that turned into velocity. The deal here is that it's not quite that simple. You can't change particles into other particles willy-nilly because it turns out that there are these conservation laws that constrain what you can change some particles into. Okay. Lepton charge is a really good one. It's really straightforward to understand. But there's also ones governing, say, before I mentioned that there were quarks on the inside of all these protons and neutrons, and how charmed and strange and then truth and beauty quarks turned into up and down quarks. Uh, there are similar conservation laws governing how these flavors can change around. So your system is constrained. You can't just change one type of particle into any other particle that has less mass. When it decays, it always undergoes a decay that's constrained by these particular conservation laws. Okay, that makes sense because there's laws for everything in the physics world, right? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Ask, yes. <laughs> I, I just always have to feel polite. I got yelled at too many times in school. So we're talking about you know, electrons decaying and turning into other electrons or muons or tau things, the neutrino is flying off. Is what's the real significance of all of this particle decay? What what what's the end game here? Like is this where the universe comes from? Is this is this what creates the beaches around and causes helium and things to explode and create universes? Actually, yeah. In the early universe around the time of the Big Bang, really, really early universe, the energy density was so high that lots of different types of particles were allowed and wandered around. So there were tauons aplenty and stuff like that. I mentioned before that the reason we don't have tauons, we have electrons in this day and age, is essentially because the energy dissipates. But the energy density back then was so high that almost anything could have been excited. 
And then as the universe expanded and cooled off, one effect that this expansion had was it lowered the energy density. It lowered the temperature of the universe. And doing so means that suddenly there wasn't enough energy for a Talon to wander around free because there wasn't enough energy for electrons and muons to get excited up and to change into Talons. And so the Talon would change into a muon or an electron and that energy would dissipate. And the muons would turn into electrons, and then that energy would dissipate. As the universe expanded. As the universe expanded. So the story of particle decays is really, as you alluded to, it's entirely related to the story of why the universe is composed of uh, the particular types of matter that it, it has in it. Okay. So it turns out that each of these fundamental elementary particles, at rest, uh, they'll all have kind of a unique decay rate. Regardless of what time of day it is, regardless of what kind of music is playing on in the background, uh, a Tauon will always decay into a muon and an electron at certain rates. And this process, it's an exponential decay, which means that, you know, in the first quarter of a second, half of these muons will turn into electrons. And then you'll have, uh, you know, the population of muons on the table will have halved. And then in the next quarter second, half of those remaining muons will turn into electrons. And in the next quarter second, half of those remaining ones. I mean, the number of particles that you have left essentially halves every time you go through one half-life. So it, yeah, it goes from, you know, 16 to 8 after one half-life, to 4 after two half-lives, to 2. It gets a bit fuzzy after one, but uh, essentially that's it. You just keep having the number of particles in your sample. And then the half-life is characteristic. It hasn't changed since the start of the universe. It's fundamental in nature to the muon or the tauon or the strange quark. Okay, and is this similar to like what archaeologists use to gauge how old an artifact is? Yeah, that's okay. how they do it. They look exactly. at the half-life of, um, well, carbon depends on the volume, Yeah, often carbon-14. What happens with carbon-14 is in the upper atmosphere, uh, Cosmic rays come in and hit the particles in the outer atmosphere, the carbon atoms, and they make uh, a new isotope of carbon, which is radioactive, carbon-14. And so as long as the Earth has been around, uh, the ratio of regular carbon in the atmosphere to carbon-14 is always fixed. So if you're an animal, you're breathing in carbon, you know, you eat food that's made of carbon and you exhale carbon dioxide. You're always interacting with the atmosphere. And so the ratio of regular carbon to carbon-14 in your body is always fixed to the same as the, in the atmosphere. But when you die and stop breathing, you're, uh, you stop replenishing the uh, carbon in your body. And so suddenly there's a fixed population of carbon-14 in all your bones, and that carbon-14 is radioactive and it decays. The number of particles of carbon-14 in your body will half every half-life of carbon-14, over and over and over. And so you can look at a dead animal and or dead plant, and judging by the ratio of carbon-14 to regular carbon, you can tell how old it is, when it died. Okay, and that's, so that's the same thing with particle physics, except that you're not going to be using carbon as your uh, main indicator, right? Uh, so in particle physics, when we're dealing with these these particles that decay usually they have to be created because they usually don't stick around for very long. And so they'll be either created through radioactive processes or they'd be created by cosmic rays or they'd be created by a particle accelerator. And then so the issue here is kind of people wanted to know the nature of all these new types of particles that are generated when you fire two protons at one another or you shoot electrons at each other. So each of these particles, and then more complicated particles like carbon-14, will have a decay rate, which is fixed, which is won't change for that particular type of particle. Uh, you know, a carbon-14 atom will have the same half-life now as it did 3,000 years ago. Okay. So the kicker is that physicists in the middle of the 20th century figure out ways to calculate and predict these half-lives. So it's not just a matter of stamp collecting. We don't just, you know, collect a whole bunch of carbon-14 and see how long it takes for the particles to decay. We have a theoretical model for this decay process. But we do both. Yeah, well, right. So remember the muon decay? 
It was the strawberry ice cream and it decays into vanilla ice cream plus some flavor bottles, which were the neutrinos. And the electron was the vanilla ice cream. Yes. Well, well, let's start with what happens when you eat strawberry ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So imagine a, a, a little diagram of yourself, a little stick figure of yourself. So you have these two arms sticking out and these two legs on the bottom. And then you have your torso in the middle where deliciousness happens. <laughs> so you eat your strawberry ice cream with one of your hands. And after you eat it and it goes into your body and it gets circulated from the other arm of your body as you digest the strawberry ice cream, um, you create waste products. So one of those waste products is sweat, of course. So that comes out of um, the other side of your arm. And then on the bottom, your, your, the feet of your diagram, you have two other kinds of body excrement. And, <laughs> <laughs> and one of these could be the electron and the other one, um, the electron neutrino. So it's just to help you to visualize what these Feynman diagrams look like. So you can imagine a, a stick figure and along the arms and legs is where these particles are traveling. And then the torso of your body is something called a W boson. That's your digestive system. That was well done. <laughs> that was cool. Did you understand? Yeah, I drew a picture, and it makes total sense. <laughs> you drew a picture. <laughs> so, right, there's this calculation tool called the Feynman diagram, and I'm sure you've seen them before. You've seen them on, like, physics textbooks and, like, in the background of big, fancy physics lectures that happen in movies. They're pretty ubiquitous. Um, and essentially, they're just these stick line drawings that show two sticks coming together and then another stick coming out of that and then two sticks coming out of a second vertex, right? They're just like the arms, legs, and torso of a stick man. And then variations on that. So these were invented by Richard Feynman as a way to kind of keep track of all of the different processes that could happen inside a, a particle. It's kind of like, um, you know, you'd have a muon and you put it in a box and you close the box and you open the box and there's a neutrino and an anti-neutrino and an electron in suddenly, right? We can't imagine what the process is from one going to another. So what Feynman came up with was a way of charting out the different processes because what he then came up with was not just these stick drawings that diagrammed the evolution of the system from one arm of ice cream into one arm and two legs. He also established a way to uh, assign numbers to that. So each of those represents a calculation that can be done for a specific process. And then what you can do is you can chain them together. So one tauon becomes an electron and some neutrinos, or one tauon becomes a muon and some neutrinos, or one tauon becomes a muon, which then becomes an electron, including all these neutrinos. It's a really visual way to kind of sort out all of the different possibilities. Yeah, it's really cool because each little piece of that diagram stands for a piece of a mathematical formula that will give you your final answer of what's the probability of that interaction or decay happening. Each leg or arm of your stick van has a particular mathematical form, and then the body does, which is called the propagator, and then each of the vertex, you know, where your arms meet. So you multiply each of those pieces of the body together, and you can get the probability of what will happen when you eat your strawberry ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> It'll let you calculate the probability of eating chocolate ice cream and getting strawberry ice cream versus the probability of eating chocolate ice cream and getting vanilla ice cream. Yeah, there you go. And it's a perturbative system, so there's a whole zoo of these diagrams that you can do, but in essence, the simplest diagrams are the ones that are most likely to happen. And the really, really complicated ones get less and less likely. But what you can do is you can correct your prediction to higher and higher order by making your diagrams more and more complicated because there will end up being more than one route to start from chocolate ice cream 
and end up with vanilla ice cream. And so you can use this method to chart out all the different possible routes. So for instance, you could imagine starting with chocolate and getting vanilla and anti-vanilla and strawberry, and then the two anti-vanillas cancel out and become flavor bottle neutrinos, and then the strawberry becomes, uh, you know, you can have all sorts of fairly complicated interactions that are less and less probable, but we can revise our estimates of what the probability is to higher and higher order by drawing more and more complicated diagrams. So, so radioactive atoms decay into other atoms. And the way that happens is that a neutron in the nucleus will decay into a proton, an electron, and an anti-electron neutrino. So this is the main process for radioactive decay. So the neutron decaying, it follows energy conservation rules and also these other conservation rules we were talking about, such as electrical charge, because you know the neutron is neutral, yes. and then the final products, the sum of those is also neutral, because a proton has a plus one charge, and the electron is minus one, and the neutrino is also neutral. So we have the final state also has zero net electrical charge. And then our electron number is also conserved because in the end products, we have an electron, but also the anti-electron. So we have, was it vanilla ice cream in an empty (laughs) vanilla flavoring bottle? The cool thing is if you take that neutron out and just have a neutron decay by itself, not near the rest of the atom, that process takes 15 minutes, which is really long. Because these other decays that we were talking about happen so fast, like much less than a nanosecond. Muons are what, 10 to the minus 6, and taus are 10 to the minus 13 or something? Seconds. Yeah. Something like that. Right. So Higgs, you've heard of this Higgs boson thing? Yes, it's in the news. Right. So the Higgs boson is just a particle, okay? But it's a really heavy, really unstable particle. This is why the CERN facility needed such high energies. In essence, they were smashing protons together at really high energies to be able to see it. So these protons would smash together. These would excite a Higgs boson, which would then decay. And then it could decay into a number of things, but it's not the Higgs itself that we detect. We don't have a stick that kind of gets wiggled every time a Higgs bumps into it. Instead, what we detect are the different things it can turn into. Okay, so the Higgs decays into particles that we can see, fortunately, or else we would never know it exists. The golden decay that physicists love to measure is Higgs decaying to two photons. And it can also decay to bottom quarks and anti-bottom quarks and W bosons. And those W bosons go off into leptons and neutrinos um okay sure so yeah, why is it called the golden decay because it's really easy to find it's not okay. very messy the number of backgrounds for it is low so the number of ways other decays background events could appear like this one those are few so it's called the golden decay okay sure But yeah, so in essence, uh, these Higgs bosons are invisible to us, but they decay into things, and we can theoretically predict the energies of the things they're going to decay into, right? We also empirically get them. But that's what we measured, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that was the big announcement. We'd seen these energies that say this is the byproduct of a Higgs decaying. That's right. Well, that was fun. So thanks, Ken. Thanks, Tia. You've pleased me. Your efforts have borne fruit, and that fruit is sweet. Here's some fruit. So, Ken, you get a nectarine. Mmm, delicious. And Tia, you get a peach. Nom, 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 nom. nom. You'll note that both of those fruit decay very quickly. All right, so I'd like to thank my guest. It's Dan. Thank you, Dan, for coming on. My pleasure. Where's my fruit? Um, you get a kumquat. It was sitting under the table here. (laughs) wash it off before you eat it alright thank you I'll do that later thanks buddy alright so 
Let's suppose that you, the listener, want to interact with the Titanium Physicists a little bit more. If you'd like to keep track of us, why not follow us on Twitter at, at Titanium Physics or join our Facebook group. If you'd like to hang out with us, if you'd like to hang out with us and socialize a little bit, why not join our online forum? Now, if you'd like to send me an email directly or ask a question or propose a topic, email me at barn at titaniumphysics.com. B-A-R-N at titaniumphysics.com. Now, let's suppose you want to listen to us more conveniently. If you've got an iPod or an iPad, try subscribing to our show in the iTunes Store. While you're there, write us a review. Your reviews determine our ranking in the iTunes Store, which in turn determines how many new listeners will discover the show. If you have a Zune or a Blackberry, you can subscribe to our show on those doodads as well, or you can download the Stitcher Radio app, which will let you subscribe and listen to your favorite podcasts. You can download the Stitcher app for free on your iPhone, Android, Kindle Fire, and other devices. Stitcher's convenient because it lets you subscribe to your favorite podcasts and then listen to them automatically. For all this information and more, visit our website at www.titaniumphysics.com. The Titanium Physicist Podcast is a member of Bracula Media. If you've enjoyed the show, you might also enjoy Science Sort of or the Weekly Wienersmith, so check them out. The intro music to our show is by Ted Leo and the Pharmacists, and the end music is by John Vanderslice. Good day, my friends, and remember to keep science in your hearts. to tell you dear before you come back here I lost I lost your bunny I let him out of the cage he was eating spring mix on the carpet jumped through a window out into the haze hop down magnolia Like all the things Tia said. Of, uh, <laughs> right. So. Are, are you referring to the CMS detector as a stick? Y- no, I'm saying <laughs> that there is no stick. There is no stick for the Higgs. It sounded like that was the comparison you were making. Were you, you, the right were stick. you, were you talking crap about my, my, my experiment? There's nothing <laughs> sticky about the CMS detector. That's right. It's smooth. <laughs> um. Um, anyway, Feynman diagrams, I'm sure you've seen them. There's a, there's a story about Richard Feynman. There's a couple there's stories. There's many stories about <laughs> Richard Feynman. Have you ever heard of this guy, uh, Dan? No. <laughs> oh, he's a physicist from like California. Well, he wasn't from California, but he, he ended up working in California for a while. Yeah. He worked on the, the atom bomb and stuff. Um, okay. But he was really, really eccentric. Uh, and so, and he was also really social, which is fairly rare for a physicist of his caliber. And so he invented, caliber, the, he invented these stick drawings, these Feynman diagrams, and then he bought a van and he covered his van with these drawings. And then he would drive around town with his window unraveled, like cat calling women and asking them out on dates. <laughs> and then when he'd finally get a date... He would take them out in the van and spend dinner explaining these diagrams to them. Whatever. Sounds like a good date to me. And then there's another wow. famous story where he went to... How many to, dates did he get that way? Probably lots. He was fairly handsome. It's true, I guess. Uh, and then there's another story where he went into like a... It was like a McDonald's or like some kind of restaurant on the side of the road. Um, and he came out and there was a guy standing in front of his van staring. It was a young guy in his twenties. And he said, Hey, what are you looking at my van? And the kid went, why is your van covered in Feynman diagrams? And Richard Feynman said, well, it's cause I'm Richard Feynman. And the kid went, Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) 
Okay, so just just to rehash something that you guys were saying, so I, I understand that you know you have basic little stick figures, and you can build them up to complex reactions of probability of what could happen with um, decay or what the end products would be. Okay, and so, so is is the end game here? What, so what's the reason behind knowing all of this? What was Feynman trying to achieve by understanding what would come out the other end? Well, I mean. We're physicists. We want to be masters of the universe, right? <laughs> we we want to be clairvoyant and and know everything that can happen. Okay, fair um, enough. It's 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 a little bit. I okay. So in no, truth, I think that's just about right. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> it's right too. At, at its heart, I think it's right. Um, so, in essence, you know, you you've heard of like the. Uh, Electric electromagnetic field, right? Yes, it's like <laughs> I've heard of such a thing, <laughs> right? Um, and you know about quantum mechanics, this wave particle duality. Slightly, yeah. Okay, so in quantum mechanics, everything that's a wave is also a particle, and everything that's a particle is actually a wave. So early, early quantum mechanics in the twenties and thirties, right? Uh, they were doing things using atoms. They were like shooting atoms at each other. Atoms are particles. Uh, and they were kind of dis- coming up with a description for the wave character of these particles. So they'd look at how these particles interfere like waves and have general behaviors like waves, even though we kind of imagine them to be little billiard balls. So uh, when Feynman came along, the question was, we have something like the electromagnetic field. It is a field that has waves in it. So the question is, how do we treat those waves like particles? And so the math of doing that is really complicated, really, really complicated. Well, it's not that complicated. It's pretty complicated, though. Uh, and it's a bit of a pain in the ass, and I refuse to do it. But uh, it is so complicated that people kind of had trouble getting their heads around how to do these calculations. Uh, but the useful thing was that it could be used to describe how, say, um, one... Uh, one atom would shoot off, say, an electromagnetic wave that would hit another atom. It, it could be used to describe how two different uh, systems that are inter- interacting through one of these fields could interact because this field is quantized. Um, so it was necessary, it's a necessary theoretical step to be able to describe how you know, particles interact, elementary particles interact with each other. Um, so what Feynman did was essentially he came up with this, this drawing diagrams technique and that made doing these calculations really, really simple. So suddenly, uh, everybody can do it, and they're super popular. And that's why there's so many particle physicists <laughs> now, because these five and are super, super straightforward. But in essence, it, if you want to do more than talk about how individual particles kind of bounce around in the in a system, right? So if you want to talk about more than the trajectory of one particle, and you want to talk about how different particles are interacting. They interact through one of these fields, like the electromagnetic field. And so you need a way to use quantum mechanics to describe that field in order to talk about how particles, you know, uh, interact on a fundamental level or how they decay, for instance. This is one of the big things that was going on about. So this whole description of decaying particles is useful because it gives us a nice way to sharpen our teeth for describing other quantum mechanical systems, right? It gives us a window into the larger quantum mechanical world. Okay, that makes total sense, for sure. And why do we care about the quantum mechanical world? The answer to that is because physicists want to know everything. (laughs) (laughs) That's also fair enough.